Welcome to the 2021 Sunstone Symposium session, uh, 155 Radiant Mormonism, honoring Warner Woodsworth and Kathy Stokes. At Sunstone, we're making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there's more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to, a better, to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. After the symposium, Sunstone staff will edit, polish, and re-upload all of this year's session videos to the Hoover app. It'll take about two weeks for everything to be available, but once it is, every video will be available to watch and re-watch in the Hoover app through the end of 2021. Please type any questions into the Hoover app to be addressed during the, the Q&A, or if you're watching in person, we'll open the audience uh, for questions at the end as the can allows. About this presentation, in his essay, Radiant Mormonism, Richard Bushman said, Richard Bushman uses Radiant Mormonism for certain Latter-day Saints who have a dis disproportionate influence for good in the world. The term suggests that these people radiate from Mormonism like rays of light and beams of energy from the sun. They're not official, but a part of each of them originates in the church and in core Mormonism. They are part of great Mormon sphere to influence that reaches far beyond the church itself. This new annual session of Sunstone begun in 2018 includes interviews with two individuals who exemplify the radiance of Mormonism. I'll take a second to introduce you to our speakers before we begin. Bob Reese, visiting professor and director of Latter-day Saints uh, Mormon Studies at Graduate Theological Union, is the author of two recently published books, A New Witness to the World, Reading and Rereading the Book of Mormon by, by Common Consent 2020, and Why I Stay, The Challenges of Discipleship for Contemporary Latter-day Saints, Volume 2. Kathy Stokes is a pioneering Black Latter-day Saint whose journey includes beginning life as a sharecropper's daughter in Mississippi to, to graduating from both nursing school and university in Chicago to serve as deputy director of the Illinois Department of Public Health and becoming a dedicated community volunteer and leader in both Illinois and Utah, a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right after the lifting of the priesthood and temple ban, Stokes is recognized as a strong and dedicated leader. Among other positions, Stokes has served as a trustee of the Chicago Inner City Youth Charitable Foundation, members of the Utah AIDS Foundation Board of Trustees, member of the Salt Lake Public Library Board, and the Editorial Advisory Board for Deseret News. She's also a member of the Utah chapter of the Afro-American Afro Historical and Genealogical Society. Warner Woodsworth is widely recognized for his pioneering work as a global social entrepreneur an emeritus professor of the Marriott School of Business at Brigham Young University. He has trained and mentored several generations of social entrepreneurs while also helping to organize more than four dozen NGOs that now operate in 62 countries and raise nearly $30 million uh, in donations annually. In addition to his 40 years at the BYU faculty, Woodsworth has taught at Claremont Graduate School, the University of Michigan, the University of Rio de Janeiro, Utah State University, and the University of Utah. He's the author or co-author of Working Toward Zion, United for Zion Principles for Uniting the Saints to Eliminate Poverty and Radiant Mormonism. I'll now give the floor to our presenters. Ms. Andrew, do you mind closing those doors so we keep the sound down? So well, thank you for coming today. Just reminds me of the story of the itinerant uh, evangelist preacher who went uh, throughout uh, Wyoming preaching uh, the gospel and uh, not having too much luck attracting people. So he put out tracks to tell people that on a certain day, they would, uh, there would be a big camp meeting so uh, uh, he showed up at the camp meeting and uh, just one person sitting on the front row. And thought, well, I've come here to preach the gospel. Uh, at least I have one person to do that to. So he unraveled his whole hour long uh, uh, hell and fire brimstone presentation, uh, the same as he would have done if there had been a thousand people. He stepped down off the podium and shook hands with this farmer and uh, said, well, what do you think? 
Or say, well, I liked it a lot, but out here, you know, we raise a lot of hay. And if I brought a truck of hay and then loaded it, and brought a truck, of, a truck full of hay, I'd be damned if I would have loaded it with just one cow. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to unload today. <laughs> you know, Milton spoke about his great poem, Paradise Lost, and he said he was writing it for a fifth audience, no few. So uh, you can consider this a kind of Mil Miltonic uh, presentation today. In his presentation, Radiant Mormonism, uh, delivered both at Palo Alto and at Graduate Theological Union, where I teach, in 2017, Richard Bushman, who had written uh, an essay called Radiant Mormonism, argued the Latter day Saints have a disproportionate influence for good in the world. I think that needs to be tempered with the idea that Latter day Saints are better, uh, smarter, or anything else. But he says they have a disproportionate influence for good in the world. One might say potential disproportionate influence. So, any examples of such radiance in scholarship, education, philanthropy, politics, humanitarian service? and the arts, Bushman says this, this influence of radiant Mormonism is even broader than some people think about. The term suggests that certain Latter-day Saints radiate from Mormonism like rays of light and beams of energy. Like beams of energy, like rays of light from the sun. They are not official, but part of each of them originates in the church and in core Mormonism. They are part of a great Mormon sphere of influence that reaches far beyond the church itself. It's interesting that that sentiment of Bushman is confirmed by a book called The Triple Threat by Amy Chu, a non Latter day Saint, called The Triple Package. And she said that just the Latter day Saints have a disproportionate influence not only in the areas that Bushman talked about but in politics and in business. She identifies eight groups of people in the United States, subgroups, subpopulations, that have uh, uh, an inordinate influence in relation to their population. They're all hyphenated except for two, Nigerian Americans, Iranian Americans, Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, I don't know what the other hyphenated are, but the two that are not part of that, that kind of hyphenation are Jews and Mormons. So she did this study in which she looked at the influence of Latter day Saints, basically because we represent such a small, less than 1% of the world's population. She was seeing that the, the influence that we have uh, is much beyond what one might expect. So, characteristic of this radiance is what Bushman identifies as kind of a palpable light and energy that he speculates is a combination of American optimism. Uh, and that is this idea that we can do anything, uh, even if it's wrong. Uh, and the theology that embodies both self reliance and the vision of unbound, unbounded potential. One of the greatest things about the restoration is this idea that a, one individual can do much beyond what anyone might expect. As Joseph Smith said something like that. If I were put into uh, the, the deepest uh, pit in Nova Scotia and the Rocky Mountains piled in on top of me, I would come out on top. Well, that sense of optimism is one of the things that is characteristic of uh, Latter-day Saint uh, theology, <clears throat> what we call, or, or at least used to call, Mormonism. Some of us do. In the, in the language of the Doctrine and Covenants, according to this theology, each person is born into the world Grace in the church. with light. Well, I acknowledge that it is. Until we acknowledge its existence and presence, life straight up. Kathy, it's not your turn yet. We're not This is where we are. We have all these notions about one another. Stop stopping around for a and sometimes on an intellectual level, you know, it's not true. And yet on a feeling level, so you have to get your feeling and your intellect. 
Christmases ago, and my kids and grandkids were in the house. One of, sons, one of my grandsons said, could we watch a, a video? And as I'm fumbling with the video, he calls out to his mother in the kitchen, Mama, Baba doesn't know what he's doing. Well, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is also true here. here today. Anyway, that combination, as I said, of American optimism and the theology that embodies this idea that each person is born into this world embodied with the light, and not only his or her, not only his or her innate eternal intelligence, but what we call the light of Christ. So each person comes into the, the world with a, a native light uh, of intelligence and that is uh, expanded with the light of Christ. And as we magnify that light, we receive additional light, both from our own expanding light and from the light of others. It's one of the wonderful things that Dale and, uh, uh, and I were talking at, uh, at lunch about the fact that uh, we each have the opportunity to learn from and bring and gather light from others. The scattered light in the universe that God has placed everywhere, we can gather that light to, to us, and it, which according to modern revelation, allows us our light to go brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Well, since Latter-day Saints, Latter Saints believe humans can become gods or the embodiment of all light and truth, which I think is a wonderful definition of what it means to be a god, that the radius of divinity can be manifest in humanity. As Bushman says, I think the only thing that would motivate so much selflessness that engenders radiance is the promise of becoming what we want to be in our highest aspiration. It is the hope that God will lift us up and make us holy, loving, and intelligent. He will make us worthy to be loved and accepted. That promise, which he says, moves us to consecrate our lives to greater uh, life. And then he says, I believe that radiant Mormonism has as its mission the formation of trust. Wherever Mormons are, they engender that trust. And we have to show that we only desire the best for people around us, and that we have to demonstrate our competence, that we have to demonstrate our competence. We don't engage in this work, he says, in our church meetings. I think it's really interesting. Pushing would make a distinction between what we do in our church meetings and what we do in our individual lives. We develop trust in the course of our ordinary lives, in our professions, in our neighborhoods, in our organizations, in our families. We do it in places where we advance good causes and demonstrate our skill. We do it when we show our integrity, our good hearts, our capacity. That's how we ready ourselves for the disruptions of the latter days. And if disruption is one of the characteristics of the latter days, I think we are here. Kathy Stokes is one of those people who fit, uh, fits that category of radiant Mormonism, the biography sketch that uh, was read of her uh, is, uh, uh, is characteristic of a woman born in poverty uh, on a share of crop uh, farm in Mississippi, rising to a significant height by her own determination. And then uh, on a trip to a uh, business trip to Hawaii, uh, hears something about the church, listens to the missionaries, embraces the gospel in Chicago, uh, and uh, then uh, uh, joins the church there, uh, becomes the first black temple worker in the church. That's what her, her distinction Moves to Salt Lake, where she continues to be a radiant uh, figure who has uh, uh, done many things in this community and is seen by the church as one of the really great uh, spokespersons for someone who uh, is in that margin between uh, the different worlds that uh, the church makes up. Kathy is noted for asking challenging questions and speaking the truth of her heart and her mind. She sometimes does that with her reverence and sometimes with a few uh, words that uh, are not normally spoken in church, but 
in the context in which he speaks them, absolutely acceptable and, uh, and understandable. And she's speaking of you, she said, I always got into trouble for asking questions. She says, I still do. The people who know her, the character that I, this kind of trouble as good trouble or necessary trouble of which U.S. Congressman John Lewis spoke. There's good trouble. Uh, and Kathy uh, has been in that. She's been and continues to be an ambassador for the church to black, white, and other communities. When I think of her work in the community and in the church, I think of what Shirley Chisholm, Chisholm the black activist, said. She said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. I think that is uh, uh, Kathy. Well, unfortunately, when I, I got to uh, uh, Utah this week, we found uh, Goya, and I found that Kathy had been hospitalized and uh, uh, was told that she wouldn't be able to be here today. And that was, uh, for me, uh, a real disappointment. But anyway, Gloria and I decided to uh, go to the hospital and visit Kathy. We had a wonderful visit with her. And Gloria took her phone and recorded some of that uh, conversation. And so we're going to yeah. hear uh, yeah. from her. But what would you do to address the issues of race in the church? Well, my mother said it is. Until we acknowledge its existence and precedent, <laughs> This is far we are. Those of you on Zoom, quick bathroom break, get something to drink, and you're right back. <laughs> might be uh, some important people. Just tell them what you know, what's part of that. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Okay. So uh, let's see. You want to check all the topics for a moment? That's on. So, uh, part of what uh, in the conversation with Kathy is uh, has to do with how, as a black person, having converted to the church, having lived having lived in a, uh, a really a great multicultural city in Chicago, and then moving to Salt Lake where she is a minority, kind of what her perspective is. Uh, and so part of the conversation is uh, just about that. Uh, and, uh, I know it's coming up. Okay. Uh, I was a missionary in Chicago 65 years ago. And uh, I well remember knocking on doors uh, in uh, suburbs of Chicago. And when a black person uh, answered the door, we were told to go in and to be polite, but not to go back. Uh, that was part of the church I grew up in. And even then, as a 19 year old missionary, something seemed wrong to me about that. Something internally, because the, the people I met seemed so receptive. They seemed so eager for the message of the restoration. 
They seem so happy to receive that initial uh, uh, message from us, which was the, in those days, it was the first vision. That's what you did, you told that story. And uh, not to be able to go back, and I, I've often wondered about that, and uh, some of you are old enough to remember Marion B. Hanks, who served his mission, and that mission uh, years before I did uh, in the Northern States, and about uh, a black family that he converted, and he discouraged them from coming to, to Zion, but they insisted on coming. And he knew kind of what they would encounter here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so that, that period of time uh, between, uh, that, uh, between 1857, when that doctrine was kind of solidified, until 1976, when it was partially uh, removed, and then until uh, about four years ago, when we had the, uh, 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 the celebration at the uh, <coughs> conference center. I'm going to give it to Shane now. So, this is an interview with uh, Kathy Stokes from her hospital. That uh, would hopefully the sound will work. But what would you do to address the issues of race? If she were a problem. Until we acknowledge its existence and address it straight on, we're not this is where we are. We have all these notions about one another. Uh, and sometimes on an intellectual level, you know it's not true. And yet on a feeling level, we will want to. So you have to get your feeling and your intellect in constant heart of the head. Yes. Um, and then to examine how uh, every ways we can to, to work it out, ways we know how to work things out. We think things through when it's a good way. And we say, well, this does not make sense. This does make sense. And we move on. But the uh, all day I'm just accepting I'm the greatest, the best. You're the servant, it's not about good. You said in a private conversation we had, we were talking about that she's the only person I'm not doing wrong for me. She's saying, tell the truth. That seems to be the hardest thing in the world. It seems to be the hardest thing in the world. Um, you know, black folks have stories about or white folks have stories about black folks. Black folks have stories about white folks. They're just as true or not true as they can be. But it calls us back from knowing one another. And it's if we want to know that we may love it. Well, I've gone out, but I've gone out of state. said something kind of quite beautiful and not one of the things we need to do is to reach out and touch one another. Yeah. If you touch somebody's hand, yes. how does the rest of that go? How to make this world a better place if you can. I don't, I don't understand why, but we have to come unafraid. Trusting that. Trusting is just not the Trusting is a small step. 
I now have to remember my total life of person. I must have a lot to go back. I have to remember that I was a person. Something broken, right? I felt something, you know, heartache for me because the people that I talked to seemed so open and receptive to the restored gospel. So it's just wonderful to see faithful people like you who have stayed and been faithful and testified of the goodness of the church, not being overwhelmed by the things that are not right. And this is where and why I believe so many young and not so young my members have looked to you for inspiration. You have an example to have how it's possible to move even paradox and contradiction in your heart and still be faithful to that. All you need is love, I think, at the field side. So, but you also need love. You always need love. Now, this is uh, something Jesus, it's interesting uh, to when Jesus uh, taught the Sermon on the Mount, he wanted to make sure the people were fed first. Right. Feed them, then teach them. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's such an honor for us to have an opportunity to celebrate your faithfulness, Kathy. Well, something there is as far as I'm concerned. In Chicago State, uh, Raven Hope Square One of the other where were you at when you were in Chicago? High <coughs> Park. Yeah. Right around the University of Chicago. Yeah. It was, uh, it was fun for me to be a missionary in Chicago. That was many years ago. And uh, to see now how uh, right. uh, Lives and points of worshiping together. I had a nice note from uh, Sister Kimmel, uh, Lemon, talking about how her son thought you were her sister, thought you were part of the family. Yes. And uh, well, I didn't know why. I wasn't in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's your sister, isn't she? And in a, in a way that exemplifies where we are in the church today. You are everybody's sister, we're brothers and sisters. Right. And um, sometimes it takes a little child to remind us of uh, those things that Jesus taught. Yeah, it's interesting as you talk about that, Kathy. The image that comes to my mind is the one who said, if I could just touch the hem of Jesus, right. just get just that much, yeah. when you heal me. Right. And I, what you're saying is that if we reach out and touch one another in that way, we're something here in healing. Uh, uh, we are all born to be touched. Amen. We are all born to touch. We can't even bring the touch of stop. No. No. You have touched the lives of so many people. 
absolute blessing. This is so I Blessed to reach out that thing. Blessed to reach out. Listen, that reaching out and that looking into somebody's eyes as the radiance of the gospel shines. When Kathy's daughter was calling her, we had to at the end that uh, when I think of Kathy and uh, her devotion. The devotion of these other beautiful people who come to bless us in our community. Um, I think that the I think of the way that she and they represent a sterling example of the life of service. I think of Kathy, I think of the African saying, if it came out of woman, man, you better believe it. There's a beautiful episode in Alan Payton's novel, Cry the Beloved Country, which an Anglican priest, uh, Michael uh, uh, Kamala, doesn't know where his son is. His son has gone to Johannesburg, and he leaves the far hill country to go down to Johannesburg to find his son. He doesn't know that his son has killed a white man and in hiding. But when he goes to Johannesburg, he's a stranger there, and he's taken in by other people uh, who... Uh, give him a place to stay and give him what he needs, help him find his son. And after a period of time when he's not been able to be successful, he returns to one of the women who has taken him in, Mrs. Nassidi. And he says to her, Mother, why do you why do you take care of me? Why what explains that you are willing to take a stranger like me into your home? And she says something that I've never forgotten since I first read that novel as a, uh, an undergraduate in She says to Michael Kamara, why else are we born? We're not, if we can't do this, why else are we born? And I, that spirit, I think, is, um, uh, is, is Catholic. Why else are we born? Why else do we live if we can't do that? The sentiment is similar to that spoken by Alice Walker. It's so clear that you have to cherish everyone, she says. That's what I get from these older black women. And every soul must be cherished, and every flower is to bloom. So I hope that all of you listening today can hold in your hearts a sense of love and appreciation for Kathy Stokes, for the good people like her who radiate the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That ends the first part of our program. We are now privileged to honor another radiant Latter day Saint, uh, Warner Woodworth, a friend of mine for many years. And um, when, I, when I was thinking of someone we could honor uh, at this session of uh, Sunstone, Warner was the first person that came to my mind because I have watched his work <coughs> over the years. Uh, the, um, the kind of work that he's done that I see as what we best do, which is combine the gifts that we have, uh, and all of us are given to it, with the needs of the world and the masters, find a way in which what we do can make a difference uh, in the world. I first learned of Warner when I read his book, Working Towards Zion. Uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, I, I read that book and I said, yes, this is true. And it inspired me uh, when uh, some friends and I uh, discovered that there was a need for someone to begin addressing malnutrition in the church. Uh, I was inspired by the things that uh, Warner and his uh, co-writer had uh, published in uh, working uh, toward the <coughs> Uh, appropriately, uh, and, and I didn't know this when I invited Warner to be part of this program. I didn't know that his new book is called Radiant Mormonism. And it's going to be published uh, this year uh, by Cofer Books and uh, will be, I, I think, a chronicle. We can 
we can talk about this uh, uh, a little bit uh, later, but uh, when uh, Richard Bushman was writing his essay on rating Mormons, he said this, I was vaguely aware of all of this humanitarian activity, uh, this humanitarian philanthropy. I was aware of this because of Warner Woodward's argument that Mormons would bring in the law of consecration individually by creating a multitude of private charities. Think of that, the law of consecration. Even though the church does not now practice the law of consecration, there's nothing that would forbid us from doing it as individuals. And Warner, I think, exemplifies that kind of consecration by individually creating a multitude of private charities. To prove his point, uh, Warner names scores uh, in, in his conversation. Uh, Bushman says he names scores of these enterprises. Uh, and then Bushman says, through my fundraising, I've learned by myself how accurate Woodworth was. There's no doubt that Latter-day Saints are into philanthropy in a big way. When I wrote last week to, to Richard saying we're going to be honoring uh, uh, Warner and uh, uh, Kathy Stokes in this session, he said, Warner deserves all the honor he can get. <laughs> and that's uh, so. Um, this is Warner in his own words. My lifelong purpose is that of being a social innovator. Around the globe, people call me a disruptor, a change agent, and sometimes a renegade, maybe sometimes worse than that. <laughs> Many refer to me, he says, as a catalyst, that is a movement shape. My life is one of collaborating with others. This, I think, is the genius of Warner's work. He has collaborated with others. He's taken the talent and the gifts and the resources of others, joined him with his own, and created something that I think is not only highly significant, but really quite, quite beautiful. So we're collaborating with others to develop a sense of community, of high ethics, of deep relevance. I labor to build capacity among the global poor. What a noble goal that is. Among the global poor, the marginalized, those who suffer. My objective is greater democracy in the world, not top-down control by elites, but rather my long-term dream of creating a better world of peace and social justice, a place where everyone has a voice and where all can not only survive, but thrive. The paradigm of my work is that of empowering the world's have-nots so that they may enjoy, and may enjoy a more, sustain, more sustainable lives. So, as I would have with Kathy, and had she been here, I'm inviting uh, you know, Warner to come up and have a conversation with me. Uh, looks like we have some uh, rescue. Look at these big pieces to the rescue. This is like these guys were like Brigham Young going to say, Go out to the plains, take, the, take these things out, and rescue those people. What this is work. So, Instead of foodstuffs and um, that, we're getting uh, a PA system which will help us uh, speak more clearly and audibly both to our present audience and uh, to uh, to those in the in the Zoom world. The Zoom world, like the poor, I think will always be with us, uh, <laughs> given this new technology and the wonders that uh, that it allows. Uh, until that. Um, uh, that set up order. I think uh, you and I can begin sure. uh, talking about uh, this work. The first question I wanted to ask, going back to the point at which your great humanitarian work began, uh, talk about that. What is it that motivated you? I'm sure as a young person uh, uh, imagining this uh, work, those uh, down here are saying, Oh, there's enough. Thank you. Each on the microphone to his own. <laughs> so I wanted to ask about when you when you first began. I doubt that you could have seen the unfolding of your that beginning. As most of us can't from whatever begins, although sometimes we see the dream and we work toward it. So share with us just kind of the beginning the uh, origin of this uh, most important work that you've been doing for 
the last what? 40 years? 50 years? Yep. Yes. Or longer. Or longer. Yeah. Well, I, I realized our world is full of materialism and greed. There's a lot of good things, but there's so much selfishness and there's so much a sense of passivity that we can see the problems out there, but we're uncomfortable with it. I have friends, relatives tell me that all the time. When they see the crisis, they change the channel. They feel powerless. And maybe they write a check to the church and maybe they say, I'm glad that USAID our government is doing some work globally. <laughs> One way, Bob, I have been able to kind of keep focused on this is stuff like this. See my little bracelet here from a chief in the village in Walesabubu in Mali, in West Africa, who gave me this, and others have done the same for 25, 30 years now. Giving me a little token to put on my wrist, kind of like the Jews with their amulets, and tangible symbols to remind them of God and of the Torah and of the past struggles of the people, the Hebrew people, <clears throat> in the past as well as today. So this little bracelet, the chief said, now, this is so you won't forget us. And I said, well, I'll never forget you. You won't was, forget that. <laughs> it, was a, it was a brain, <laughs> a brain mapping process. Yeah. Is it still on? Yes. So uh, he said, I know you're going to a culture where people like us, the third poorest country on the planet, we're not, remember, we're, people are, in your country are not aware of us. You have more supplies in one of your big stores. What do you call them? I said, supermarket. So he said, yes, you have more in one of those than our 36 villages combined. And we know it will be hard when you're in that environment. And so I, I wear these bracelets, this and others, often to keep my mind focused on those who suffer, on the humble, on the rejected, on the ignored, on the forgotten. Uh, but Bob, like you, I first got aware of what I wanted to do in my life on my mission. I didn't get to go to big, beautiful Chicago. I went to Brazil. And there served in these little towns. There were about a thousand members in the whole country. I think there's 23 missions now. And I know some of you, I see by your faces, you think I opened up South America with Parley Pratt. <laughs> no, I, I came along a century later. But uh, there too, I went into these homes and in these villages and in these little towns. And I saw rampant poverty, especially among black Brazilians, Afro-Brazilians. And when I more fully understood, we weren't to teach them the gospel, but to leave, leave them a blessing, leave them a little pamphlet, and go on to find other people to convert and build the church. I was uncomfortable. So I did some teaching, illegal, unofficial. And a few people were baptized, not because of our pushing them, but our response after they reacted to our invitation about the same thing. And I came back from my mission as I had begun on my mission, troubled by that practice of blacks not able to enjoy the blessings of the priesthood. So once a week, from 
1961 until 1978, when the announcement was made and the policy was changed. Once a week, I fasted, and every day for that time, I prayed that that change might come for my brothers and sisters in Brazil and the many others I'd met after my mission in Michigan, in Detroit, where I worked, for example, in Michigan when I was at the University of Michigan, when I helped organize a big strategy, a strike, a student strike to shut down the 40,000 student University of Michigan campus and, and uh, force the university to start a black studies program and to create a fund to let and, and finance young black people from Detroit 20 miles, an hour, uh, 20 miles away that could never get in that great white elite major U.S. university because they couldn't afford it. And we got a $5 million fund for scholarships to start helping young people. And, and that's when I realized we have power. I can make change. I can work with others and address a social issue or an economic problem, whether in Brazil or in Michigan, and make a difference. And so that's how I got started. Was there anything in your, with your parents or in your own family where your parents were teaching you uh, this kind of uh, uh, orientation toward others? Well, my dad was a Methodist who eventually joined the church. The Methodists were the ones Joseph Smith said had the closest religion to Mormonism of any American church. And so my dad, I, but I didn't learn a lot from my dad. He was just a good guy, but pretty quiet. My mom was an activist. She wasn't a social activist, but she was full of them and vigor. And she took on issues. And, and from her, I learned, I can do lots of stuff. I have the potential to reach out and impact others, to not just silently walk by some stranger, but say hello, be friendly, be Christian, be Mormon. <laughs> and that kind of, her personality, I know kind of helped me, even though we never talked about blacks in the priesthood or the struggles in Brazil, although she was interested in some of the poverty there. But uh, she got me with the personality I needed. And then at Michigan, I had that experience, not working with Native Americans there. And then and when I came to Provo teaching MBAs, it was tough to get that on the agenda, to talk to them about using their business skills and their economic analysis and their leadership and management training to do something more than help Wall Street, to do something a little different beyond becoming a CEO or inventing their own company or living in their mansion with one wife and 3.2 kids. And so little by little, I began pushing that issue with some, and that opened the door. So give us an idea of order of the range of the entrepreneurial uh, programs uh, um, that you and your students and your friends have initiated around the world. Give us an idea. I know microfinancing is part of it. I know the uh, things. Give us some idea of the range of uh, these, uh, these projects and where they are in the world. Well, they're in lots of countries. Um, maybe I can just illustrate the first little NGO was started while I lived for a year with my family in Hawaii. And I'd gone there to write a book because I couldn't get much done on campus in Pro with tons of students and faculty demands and committee meetings, all that stuff. So I went to Hawaii and there I taught a course and half of that class uh, were Filipino kids. And I taught about worker ownership and worker cooperatives and the early United Orders that Brigham and Joseph started in Kirtland, in Nauvoo, in Salt Lake, and then in 400 cities in the West. 
where <clears throat> individuals came together, united in a purpose to lift one another up. This crazy idea, the law of consecration and stewardship. Could we practice it today, even though the church officially wasn't doing it, institutionally wasn't advocating it? In the temple, we made covenants to adhere to it, to practice it in our individual lives. So I was, I was trying to help these young people in Hawaii, the Tongans, the Samoans, but especially a bunch of these uh, Filipino kids. And they said, Warner, we're, we're struggling in this Oahu Island. Our families back home have nothing. The Philippines, I found out, used to be the number two economy in Asia. And by the early 80s, it was second from the farm. So there was mass unemployment, a lot of poverty. And these young people were saying, when you go back to Utah, could you get some friends there and start some project like you helped us start? We started a little co-op. We got the Catholic Church to lease us some land and start growing produce. And because the Filipinos in Hawaii were all working in the gardens and the farms owned by the Haoles, the rich Americans, and the Japanese, the rich Japanese, and the rich Chinese. And, 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 the, and so the Filipinos were struggling eating hand to mouth because Hawaii is an expensive place. So we started this little co-op up on the North Shore and it created a bunch of jobs and they were blessed and, and these kids were impressed and they said, promise us before you go home, you'll go to the Philippines and help our relatives there. So I came back with that commitment and started that little idea uh, of creating jobs for impoverished Filipino Latter-day Saints. And I went to the dean and said, I want to start a course. In addition to my regular load, which was three different preparations, I'm willing to do one more class. Will you allow me? Can I get a room to do it? Can I get a time to do it? He asked what it was. I explained it. He said, well, that's got no future. <laughs> I said, I know you're the dean, I'm sure you're right, <laughs> but maybe we'll just try it. Well, I couldn't get official permission. So I created the course, Black Market, you know, underground, with a bunch of kids. Started with three kids, and then six, and then 10 or so. It was a small seminar in which we studied why the economy of the Philippines had dropped so precipitously. Mm -hmm. What could be done? And then I got some funding from another friend to send three students there that summer. And we did an analysis of the Philippines, what nonprofits were there, what NGOs, non-governmental organizations were there, what was working, what was the Catholic Church doing, what was the LDS Church doing, mm -hmm. why weren't their impacts greater? And then we started this little program called Philippines Enterprise Development Foundation. And then we, we did that in Manila and then spread it to two other islands and then created a much bigger organization, organization now known as Mentors International. And we've helped create hundreds of thousands of jobs and we've blessed lots of lives with micro enterprise, which is giving loans to impoverished women and letting her start a business, not giving her a handout, giving her a loan she has to pay back with interest, but teaching her and mentoring her in how to become a micro entrepreneur with a tiny little business and grow that thing. And took off from there. So in your, as I understand, some of your Things have been a kind of cooperative thing that you and some of your students from the, the Marriott School have engaged in. You, you, you've taken their interests and yours and the resources and done some of these things. Uh, is there anyone of those that stands out among your students who 
have been particularly uh, visionary in taking the things you were taught and never teach your hooks. At least one student will get the idea and <laughs> take it out into the world. Uh, is there anything? Sure, about? yeah. Uh, I mean, I've really been blessed to be able to tap in to the young Latter-day Saint population, both at the Y, the U, Utah State, UVU, as well as LDS kids and their friends, not just Latter-day Saints, but their, their friends at Stanford, at Virginia Tech, at Harvard, in Germany, in London, Cambridge, as well as lots of campuses across the country, where we have seen a problem, decided to address it, formed a little project, not a new organization to start with, but let's try this. And if it works, we'll grow it into something bigger and more sustainable. So let me just give you one example. Uh, I'm thinking of Sarah Carmichael, Canadian young woman, neuroscience master's degree student, who joined me when I started recruiting a big bunch of students after gaining legitimacy with that little Filipino effort, a small class. I started rounding up 50 students, 60 students, 70 students for the next project, the next startup, the next nonprofit organization, the next country. So Sarah joins this class of about 40 students. And it occurred after the Asian tsunami that hit 13 countries around the Indian Ocean in December 2004 and killed 230 thousand people in those countries. And I went into class the next, that, that was, I uh, can't remember the exact date. Well, it, it, was, it was Christmas Eve, the 24th. It was my birthday, I remember. It was my birthday. So the next semester started January 3rd or 4th, and I go into a new class called Social Entrepreneurship. It was a new course at BYU. I taught it for handful of years, I guess. And it was growing in influence when we were starting the project. And into this class comes this person named Sarah. And when I said, those who want to help do something with the material you're reading and the articles you're studying and the books you're analyzing and the lectures you're hearing and the projects you're doing, those who want to mobilize together Let's think about starting a new NGO to help the victims of that earthquake in the ocean and the destruction of those countries. And out of that, she became one of the class leaders because she had the skills and she had the brains and she had the compassion. And she was more mature than many of the younger students. So she became the leader and led our first team of six or eight students to Thailand, to a place called Khao Lok, which is not, not, you know, it's a few hundred miles from Bangkok. It's along the coast where dozens of villages were completely destroyed. And the jobs of fishermen who had been fishing off that coast for a thousand years, their boats were wrecked. Some of them swam to shore, other were pulled out, their families, their homes, everything was pulled out after the floods came in and went back out. And so Sarah became uh, one of the leaders of that team that summer. She was engaged to a guy who was serving in Iraq, the US Army. She was worried about him. She prayed about him every day. She prayed about the people in Thailand. And that little project was called Wave of Hope as opposed to the Waves of Destruction. And we raised $116,000 to get that project started. <coughs> it just kept going. And from that, like a number of other students, she eventually grew older. She graduated. She got married to that guy. She has five kids of her own. But she started her own NGO, Dolls of Hope. And she's made with her friends over 500,000 handmade dolls 
to give to children in refugee camps from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from uh, Myanmar, kids that from people that were shipped out by the government there. Now they're in the jungles living so humbly in the jungles of Bangladesh, one of the other poorest countries on the planet. So she's just one of dozens of stories. One of the things that I've noticed, whereas my wife and I have traveled to different parts of the world, we're going to Guatemala next week, uh, is that uh, many of the missionaries who serve in these countries, like you, uh, fall in love with the people, but they also fall in love with the idea of helping them. And they come back and start NGOs, specifically in the country in which they serve. And so a number of initiatives that uh, are part of this large group of things that uh, you know about and that Richard uh, Bushman is talking about, really begin with a missionary living among these people. Now, when I was a bishop, for example, of a singles ward in Los Angeles in the 80s, I remember one time during a, a tithing settlement, uh, one of the uh, leaders in the board came to tithing settlement, I asked if he paid his tithes and offerings, and he said, well, I don't pay my tithe, but I pay more than I'm owed in tithing in fast offering because I've been in this country and I've seen that the fast offering funds were directly to help people. And I, you know, I'm hoping that the tithing funds do, to do as well, but uh, he said, if I, I, if I need to technically pay tithing, I can't declare I'm a tithing uh, payer, but I give more than tithing uh, to help the poor. And so basically, I, I said, bless you, brother. Let me, <laughs> let me sign that temple record. <laughs> After all, this, this is what Jesus is teaching. But I think that idea, that impulse that we have, and you talked about the fact that most people feel overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem and therefore may do something. I know you're aware of Peter Singer's work. And Peter Singer's book, uh, A Life in Can Save, is a philosopher at uh, Princeton who uh, leaves everyone without excuse because he tells stories that uh, I've used in my ethics courses at the university uh, that suggest that every person who is alive in the pub room has the capability of saving at least one child uh, in, the, uh, in the developing world with very small, if any, sacrifice. And I think you know, somehow to get that, uh, that mentality into the larger church culture, there, is, there tends to be a feeling among Latter-day Saints, well, I, I pay to the church and I pay my tithing and fast offering, and Latter-day Saints are among the most generous, charitable givers of any group of Americans. Uh, but and some will give their money to humanitarian work, but there are a large number of people who uh, could be served by very small sacrifices. And so say something about just the small sacrifice that it might take to do something. Sure. Yeah, Mother, my, my mantra is Mother Teresa's, we can do no great things, but yeah. small things with great love. And some Sometimes we're so overwhelmed with the idea of saying something great and we're paralyzed. We don't do anything at all. So say something about that. Yeah, and one of the other quotes I've used to hers, I remember going to Haiti with a bunch of donors and a few students after the earthquake there in 2010. And we went to Mother Teresa's home in Port-au-Prince the day after we got there. We were going out to set up clean water systems and rebuild orphanages and start microenterprises to create jobs for the Haitians who knew there was never gonna be a job. US investors and European corporations are all uh, either were destroyed or they're pulled out, they're not coming back. So we gotta do something for stuff. We went to that orphanage and uh, I remember holding this tiny little three-week-old baby whose parents had been crushed in the quake. The whole country was pancaked, including their White House, just flattened. And I'm holding this tiny little scrawny black baby 
and two of the students were each doing the same. And I said, let's sing. Jesus wants me for a Sunday. You know, to these little babies. I was worried it might scare them to death. But we could do it softly and sweetly, and we did. And as I was doing that, I remembered an interview Mother Teresa had with, I think it was the BBC, when a reporter said to her, there was a group of reporters, one of them said, Mother Teresa, you've given your whole life to this cause, Sisters of Charity. <clears throat> uh, and, and how can you keep doing it when there's so many millions more babies born every year into poverty that the little efforts you do to rescue someone from the gutter in, you know, Thailand or Calcutta streets or whatever, because the, the problem just is so overwhelming. How do you deal with the fact that you have no success? And I loved her response, which was, it depends on your definition of success. To me, success is being true to my mission. And that was her mission, to pull that guy out of the gutter, to save that little newborn <coughs> starving baby in Haiti after the earthquake. And uh, so I, I see so much potential as you suggest, Bob. And, and the thing that's driven my motivation to get what I usually consider to be passive, materialistic, Latter-day Saints, sit and watch in the BYU football game as if that's <laughs> the most important thing in the world. And I say, yeah, it's in the top 3,000 important items. <laughs> But is, is what happens, what we read rather, in section 58, verse 26, 27, 28, where the Lord tells us that the power is in us, wherein we are agents unto ourselves. We have the potential, each of us, to do many good things. And it's not appropriate, it's not God's way to wait to be told to wait to be instructed, to wait to be commanded. He that is commanded in all things, you know, is a lukewarm servant at best. And so when I'm mobilizing my students or my neighbors or young people in New York or friends when I'm lecturing in New York or LA and talking about these stories and people say, how can I help? I say, what do you want to do? Well, I want to write a check. Okay, you can write a check. <clears throat> if you want to really get motivated about this, you need to come with us to Haiti. You need to join our project and dedicate a few weeks, just a month of your life, to, to the refugee camps in Jordan or the Syrians in the Greek in the camps in Greece or wherever else. And your hands-on experience, your face-to-face, Face interaction, listening humbly to their stories is going to bless you and motivate you for the rest of your life. And that's what I see happening because that, that yields, Bob, a kind of transformation that they see they're not powerless. They don't need to just flip the channel. And, you know, I have a lot of wealthy friends. They say, well, I don't want to think about it. I'm writing my check to the church. The church, I trust the church will take care of them. I say, yeah, they have a lot of success. They have failures, just like most angels. But it's, it's more powerful to be personally involved, to hold that brother's hand in that village in Nigeria, or to have the women strap a baby to your back. <laughs> in Guatemala or up in Pacatancha, high in the Andes of Peru, and dance while some guys are beating their drums or playing their guitars and sing with those villagers as you bring down new computers, laptops, and iPhones and technologies to help them be connected to the outside world. But having that child on your back or visiting with that village chief sitting in the dust in 
West Africa or the jungle of East Africa. It's a life changing experience. Thank you for that. We have just a couple of more minutes. I, I agree with you. We, you know, we were taking uh, some friends with us to uh, Guatemala because there was something about, as you say, being there in the country, uh, picking up the babies, uh, talking to the people, seeing the lives that they live. And I have found these saints uh, that we work with in the Bountiful Children's Foundation, among the most faithful and self-reliant people that I have ever met. <clears throat> they are striving with all that they have to be <clears throat> faithful to the church and to be uh, do what they can for their families with extremely limited uh, resources. But I wanted to ask you just for a minute to say something. I know uh, that uh, your good wife plays a role in the work that uh, uh, the work that you've done. And I just like you to say a word about your family, about your, your dear wife and her support of this work and her involvement in it, uh, because uh, I know that she is uh, someone who has uh, inspired you and supported you in your work. Yeah, I'm blessed to have a fantastic spouse and 10 great kids, two adopted, one Mexican, one Brazilian, and three triplets. So we, we had it all, Mom. <laughs> And as I call them now, my future donors, my kids, my 25 grandkids, my first great grandchild was just born a few weeks ago. I'm telling their parents, thanks so much for giving us a future donor because they'll get their engineering jobs and their law degrees and their M and they can keep things going. But my wife Kay married me with having no clue what her life would be like, and how miserable and how much suffering she would go through. <laughs> Just before the pandemic, I was in 21 countries in one year. I try to come back every other week and be here and help her. She's had some health challenges, but she's been amazing. She's gone with me and the kids to different countries. Maybe I can I share just one quick one? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we were in. West Africa, the first time I took her there. And we were in a Jeep with a couple of our staff bouncing over the terrain of a country that was in 11 years of drought. We're suffering here in Utah in the West. 11 years is miserable. They couldn't grow anything hardly. We, so we dug a lot of wells. We dug about 50 wells over a couple of years. Period. And, and we went in this Jeep out to a little mud school we helped fund. The villagers built the Adobe school and we paid for desks, cheap wooden desks and metal window frames, no glass, but frames so they could get some outside light. No electricity in that area. And we go to this village because they wanted to thank us. And we arrived bouncing around, dust blowing all everywhere. There's about 300, 250, 300 people chanting and singing, beating drums. And they speak Bambara. They don't even speak French in those parts of the country, uh, unless they got a job or a educational opportunity in the capital, Bamako. So we're out there, we got our translator, we got the director of our NGO called Willis Abugu Alliance. And uh, our director informs the village who we are, we flew halfway around the world, greet them to see their school, to bless it with the Imam who was there, the Muslim leader to do the official blessing. We just gave a little LDS blessing to ensure the results would be positive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and after the ceremony and the dancing and the singing, there were two of these village chiefs and their wives. They each had four or five wives there. And they asked me how many wives I had. I said, I just have one. But she's as good as all five of you. I'm trying to kiss up to my bride, let her know she's special. And so this, 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 uh, this one chief says, uh, Professor Werner, how many children do you have? 
And I said, you really want to know? He said, yes. How many wives? You have this Madame here, Madame K. I said, yes, she's my only wife. <clears throat> and they kind of cheered politely, you know. And then they said, how many children? And I said, 10 children. Oh, they went crazy. They beat their drums. They chanted. They danced. A couple of guys, they have these old blunderbuss rifles from like the 1800s. They shot them into the sky. I was glad no one died. It didn't explode in the face. They don't hunt there with guns because there's no wildlife because of the of God. And then they turned to Kay and said, you have 10 children, Adam? She said, yes. And the second chief said, how many living you know, um, we looked at each other. I got tears in my eyes. Kay was just shocked. She said, what do you mean, Modibo? Translate again. What did he ask? Modibo said, he asked you, you have 10 children. How many women? She said, well, of course, they're all alive. And I'm not kidding. People just went crazy cheering. Them. They, they were so thrilled. They had never met anybody they knew who had more than two children. And they were still living. 37%, I believe, of the babies born in southern Mali at that time died in childbirth. And about 15% of the women and mothers. They were so far away from hospitals. They didn't know. They didn't know things like wash your hands before you pick up this new baby. It's just. And uh, so, yeah, that's K. And they said, okay, we give you name. I said, why don't I get a name? They said, you're just a professor. <laughs> and they talked among themselves. Then they said, Madame K, your name in Africa will be Dembanuma. She said, oh, I've waited for a name. I've wanted an African name my whole life. How do you say it? Dembanuma. She said, what does that mean? And they said, good mother. She said, oh, no, I'm a bad mom. Uh, my kids drive me nuts. I hate half of them. You know, I work them too hard. Blah, blah, blah. They drive me crazy, all that stuff. They said, no, no, no. You're good mother. You have 10 children. All of me. And uh, I'll never forget that experience. And Kay will never forget. What a beautiful story, too. And uh, thank you for that. The blindness that we have to the lives of these good people, the unawareness, the lack of uh, just the ability to. Uh, to consider them as Jesus. The, the Aramaic translation of the least of these in Matthew 25, Jesus, who spoke Aramaic, said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of these, my little brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. Thank you all for coming. This, uh, this radius, as you can see from what we saw with Sister Kathy, what we see with Brother Warner. <clears throat> Comedians that I hope inspires all of us uh, to let our radiance shine into the world. Richard Bushman concludes that uh, Mormonism has this uh, calling to glorify the world through our radiance. And uh, Jesus said, Call us children of light. Paula calls us children of light. And he says to let our light so shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our mother and father in heaven. Our mother and father in heaven, whose chief work, this is really important, their chief work, after all, we are told, is to bring to pass our individual goodness, our immortality and eternal life. That is what the, the gospel speaks of as our radiance, our that individual radiance. So brothers and sisters, friends, let your light so shine, radiate. Thank you for being here.
distinguished guests for uh, speaking to us today and sharing these great stories and thank you so much for attending and supporting the Sunstone. Thanks everybody. And on Saturday, for those of you who may be interested, we're doing a special uh, uh, hour and a half session on the Bountiful Children's Foundation. I wonder if I'm very supportive of uh, our work with the, the malnourished children of the church. Uh, and uh, so come and learn how you can be part of that enterprise. Check out online, bountiful show. That's right. Thank you.